five persons, including actress Sharon Tate, were found dead at the home of Miss Tate and her husband, screen director Roman Polyansky. The whole thing is very, Ms. Tate, who very starred in mysterious, but this is what I know. Authorities say a menacing letter received yesterday by a Vallejo newspaper was not sent by the infamous Zodiac Killer. That Area 51, the secret Air Force base in Nevada, actually exists. In Dallas, Texas, three shots were fired at President Kennedy's motorcade in downtown Dallas. He's been called the East Side Rapist. He's been called the Visalia Ransacker. The original Night Stalker. And the Golden State Killer. You have now entered into the house of mystery. The best in true crime, conspiracy, and alternative history. With Al Warren and Kevin Thompson. KCAA, the stations that leave no listener behind. Broadcasting on 1050 AM, 102.3 FM, and 106.5 FM. The trifecta of talk radio for Southern California. Okay, welcome back into the House of Mystery on day 558 of the Crazy Train. And uh, joining me today is our cop on duty, Kev Thompson. Hello, everybody. How's it going? Yeah, another day. Another hot day. Um, not supposed to be as hot today in uh, Bellevue. I think it's only going to get up to 80. But uh, it's all good. Now, we're going to continue on... Uh, true crime here and uh, this week I've been getting a lot of requests for uh, to talk more about the Green River killer um, and uh, to think about it we haven't really uh, touched off on this so um, we actually got someone that was uh, very close and involved and uh, he's moved on from being sheriff at, uh, from the uh, time of the crime and everything but now he is a congressman so um, I know he's busy. Thank you for taking the time. It's David Reichardt. Yes, thanks. Thanks for having me on. So, so uh, David, you were the uh, sheriff, and you were kind of um, in law enforcement at the time of uh, the Green River Killer, and that was quite a quite a time. I mean, he um, what did he he get convicted of forty nine and and got uh, didn't he admit to like seventy one killings or something? Uh, he initially uh, pled guilty to 48, and then uh, a couple of years later, um, another um, uh, case was, um, another body was found, and he pled guilty to that. Uh, so he actually pled guilty to 49 murders. We closed 51 cases, uh, and he said he killed somewhere between 60 and 70. Mm -hmm. Well, do you know... Um uh, li listening to your book, I, I've listened uh, to most of it, and, and throughout, um, there was a lot of times that um, the press were kind of a little bit more on the attack um, of law enforcement at the time, and they're kind of not the uh, uh, the most sympathetic, I would guess. Uh, but they, they sort of um, put it toward, uh, because a lot of the girls were, uh, prostitutes or runaways that um, um, nobody really cared and the police didn't really care about solving it um, but I can tell by the book in the way you wrote that's not necessarily true no absolutely not true um, you know the every uh, investigator every volunteer every scientist um, <clears throat> every support person that worked on that case over uh, the 19 years that that uh, it took to catch this guy were all dedicated, compassionate, caring people. And uh, yes, you know, I, I know the public uh, during those years was especially frustrated, uh, especially people who were street people frustrated that the case wasn't being solved as quickly as everyone wanted it uh, to be solved. Uh, but it wasn't because the detectives... Um, the police department, the sheriff's office didn't care. It was because of the, of the nature of the case. And so if you could imagine, um, first of all, if you were a detective in that case, it would be very difficult for you to put your, I mean, if you're not a detective, but you try to put yourself in that place, it's very difficult to, uh, to do. It's, unless you've lived 
through an experience like that, it's it's um, it's even hard for me to explain what it's like to go to work every day and collect body after body. And some weeks we collected four, five, and six bodies a week, and then you would go home and go to sleep and wonder and hope and pray that when you woke up, someone else was not killed. So we had a mission to catch this guy, um, and and it. And we were collecting uh, all the while, collecting the bodies of, of of little girls because we're talking about most of the victims were uh, from 16 to 38. So we had uh, little girls to young women, and um, <clears throat> the the um, imagine the the toll it took on the families who had missing daughters. Mm-hmm. The toll that it took well, waiting to hear, you know, whether or not their daughter was one of the found um, remains, set of remains. Imagine the toll that it took on the families who then learned that their daughter was one of the victims. And then also, you can't forget the toll on the community, but um, the toll on the detectives is one that sometimes people forget, and uh, and I know talking to investigators today, even um, and myself included in this, is these are not memories that can be erased. These are right. memories that you that you live with, right, <laughs> for the rest of your life. And 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 they haunt you because forever you're always wondering, did I do the right thing, or is there more that I could have done, or you know, so much of it just just haunts you, and case after case after case, and it just builds up. Yeah. So I, I started this case in in uh, actually in night, January of 1982. I was assigned the, the one of the first um, uh, investigations. Um, death investigations of a young girl, uh, 16, who um, was found strangled and was in the human trafficking trade. Uh, Then in July, uh, the Kent Police Department um, was assigned a case in their jurisdiction. And then in August, on August 12th, I was assigned another uh, young girl, a teenage girl, who was found in the river. And then on August 15th, Three more bodies. Two two bodies were found by a river rafter, and as I was processing the scene on August 15, 1982, uh, found another body, Opal Mills, on the riverbank. So um, that was the beginning of really the the intensive investigation. We knew on August 16, 1982, after collecting four bodies over the weekend, that we had a serial murder on our case. Mm-hmm. Uh, on our in our in our jurisdiction, and it was a serial murder case. Um, we, as we move through that case, um, imagine here, here's the difficulty of a case like this. So we had ten thousand items of evidence eventually uh, collected. We had forty thousand over forty thousand tip sheets. Uh, we didn't have computers uh, back then. Uh, we got our first computer in 1986, and it didn't correlate information. All it could do was collect information. So we were doing everything basically from hard copy um, uh, documents uh, to try and follow up this information. And Ridgeway, uh, all he had to do was to drive up to a street corner, open the door, make a deal with whoever was working on the street, Jump, they jumped in the car, they disappeared in the, into the night. And then the witnesses that we had to interview were street people. And they're a little right? hesitant they to were, talk to the police anyways. And exactly, so hesitant to talk to the police. They didn't want to be arrested for something that they might be involved in. They weren't really paying attention to who was coming and going because that was the way of the street. You got in a car, you came back, you got in a car, you came back. Um Sometimes you get in a car and not come back, and then you, they would see you the next day. The people that we were interviewing on the street, um, for example, some of them had multiple names, multiple addresses, connected to multiple different cars, um, different license plate numbers, and accurate license plate numbers, and accurate uh, birth dates, and other identifying uh, information, um, always moving from place to place, changing their appearance, 
Uh, even the victims uh, in our case had multiple names, and so trying to track them down, as you can imagine, was was difficult. Mm-hmm. So he was he was in the perfect storm, so to speak, where uh, there was so much activity uh, going on and such a confusing underworld that he was able to operate in that world for quite some time without anybody really being drawn to suspect him as as the person. And and that was a you know that was something I was going to say, uh, Congressman. Is you know I'll ask the question, and it's a very valid you know very valid point. You know, whenever you believe you have a serial killer in your community, you know the the public is scared, and you know that 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 fear you know leads to other thoughts. But in this case, the public needs to understand that when you're dealing with individuals who are involved in prostitution, they are very difficult to investigate because of their nomadic lifestyle. And they do. They change their appearance. They change their names. Oftentimes, they're runaways, and you don't know who their family is, so they're very difficult to connect to somebody. What makes them so difficult to investigate is what makes them such a perfect victim to a serial killer. Well, well, right, yeah, and it's it's what, what we we discovered, and I and I think today, you know, that we have we have come a long way in recognizing how how to interact with uh, young people who um, have been moved to, you know, sort of forced out onto the street. I was a runaway when I was a senior in high school because I grew up in a family, the oldest of seven, with domestic violence. And and so I, I could identify with these kids to a certain degree as having to leave my home because of violence at home. So the vast majority, not all of the victims uh, in this case, but the vast majority of these young girls and young women left their homes because they were being physically, sexually, uh, emotionally abused. Again, not all of them, but a large percentage of them. They ended up on the street, and they were again victimized by the people on the street. So back in those days, they had people who were who would connect to uh, young girls in the human trafficking world who were called pimps. And they would take their money, they would drive them around, they would find clients for them, and... So they were taken advantage of at home, or they were victimized at home, I should say. They were victimized by the pimps on the street, who then, of course, um, put them in an, in a situation where they were victimized by the people who were buying the prostitutes, the Johns, the Tricks. And then what happened is, you know, also uh, kind of a sad uh, um, circumstance in this chain of events of being victimized is that the judicial system then victimized them one more time because we treated them as criminals when in fact these are young girls who uh, needed our help who were victims really in this whole affair and today I think we've moved past you know saying well you, you, you're a prostitute you're a drug addict you're an alcoholic we're going to arrest you and we're going to take you to juvie um, today um, you know we recognize <clears throat> that these are young girls, these are children mm-hmm. that need our help, and, and we need to get them uh, back in, into a, a caring, loving home and help them get their, you know, get back on their feet. You know, and uh, uh, again, you know, I, I work in law enforcement, and I've worked in corrections uh, for for quite some time, and I've met a, a lot of these young women who, you know, do work the streets and you're right congressman they they are women they're daughters their mothers and they do need to be treated like ladies um having said that it, it must have been very difficult when a family is missing a daughter who has fallen into this type of lifestyle and then you've got to show up at the family's door and tell them that they have become a victim of a killer um, what was that experience like, and what was their response? And was it a a relief inside of a tragedy? At least they know where their daughter is. I mean, are you understanding the question? Yeah. You know, because sometimes yeah. the worst thing is not knowing. Yes, it's it's been a question that's been asked. Uh, you know. 
I lost track of how many times uh, over the number of years, but it, it is uh, 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 by far one of the most difficult parts of uh, the job. You know, I can think of prior to my um, involvement in the, in, the, in the Green River case and having to be um, uh, you, you know part, part of a, a case that uh, is so difficult in so many ways. I, I can remember having to maybe make notifications once or twice in my career uh, that someone in a, in a family that a family member has, has passed away. Um, in this case, it was it was um, it seemed like it, you know it was once a week or once every two weeks that you were knocking on somebody's door saying um, we have identified your daughter and she uh, is not alive any longer. It's it is one of the most difficult. Imagine saying that you know 50 times to. Fifty different families, or or sixty different families, because some of the families we we you know we uh, some of the victims in this case we uh, were including in the in the Green River serial murder list of victims, but some eventually fell outside of that, and um, you know they some of the cases were individually solved, some today are still not solved. Um, but we still made those uh, notifications. Most of the detectives uh, who were working on these cases, including the missing persons cases, so we, during the length of this investigation, found over 2,500 missing women uh, over the course of this investigation and solved multiple uh, rape cases and, and other criminal cases. So you become uh, very well acquainted with community and especially with the families who have missing young girls, especially especially with the families who then have learned that their daughter's been killed by Ridgeway, um, you you know in your career you're told by your superiors as you're uh, you know become a new officer uh, don't get emotionally involved. <laughs> yes, um, but it's difficult. But, uh, you're you're dealing with such a, raw emotion. Yeah, there's no way. And, and I mean, I was a funeral at one of the um, victims' um, uh, memorial services. I've, I've attended many of the memorial services uh, back uh, during uh, the investigation, and still maintain relationships with some of the family members even today. And uh, you know, one thing that uh, we also learned as we kind of grew. Uh, matured through this case was that um, people f still today, even uh, in in this country, we we say that well, at least the families have closure. But one thing I've learned it, for these families that have lost their their dear daughter, their loved one, is that there is never closure. The only thing they ever ever get is answers to questions. That you know, is my daughter one of the victims? Did Ridgeway kill my daughter? And we can, uh, be, because of how we handle this case, we can answer that question for <clears throat> 51 of the families. We can say yes, and and they have, again, all they have is an answer to the question because they have forever lost their daughter. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I know one family who, who for, for many, many years, uh, kept their daughter's bedroom exactly how it was uh, when they reported her missing. Uh, I would, uh, and I'm yeah. I'm saying that honestly, Congressman. I I yeah. definitely would. Um, yeah. You know, I, I agree. You know that that this interview should concentrate on the victims and the victims' families and and the police work that went into this. But we would be remiss if we didn't a address Ridgeway just a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. How you know he was married. And yeah. how did his wife take the news when detectives began questioning her, saying that your your husband is a suspect, or or we have now you know uh, how did she take it when he was convicted? Yeah, she um, she was surprised, um, 
and and uh, of course she was very thoroughly interviewed and um, were convinced that uh, she had no knowledge of what was going on. Th this is uh, not unusual, you know. Um, Ridgeway, in, in this particular case, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not an expert in serial murder investigations, but I, I'm, I'm going to say I'm, an, I am an expert in the Green River case. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and so, growing up on it, but um, Ridgeway uh, picked his victims because they were vulnerable, they had low self-esteem, and, and and they were easy prey, and his wife. Uh, was vulnerable. Uh, he picked someone who had low self-esteem and was was basically just happy to have a home, uh, you know, roof over her head, food, and then usually um, uh, unusual in this case is that Gary Ridgway actually kept a job um, for thirty some years, worked at the same place. And what he did was he he would say to his wife, uh, "I'm I'm you know I'm going to go home uh, late. I'm going to be coming home late from work. Uh, it's none of your business why. Oh, wow. I'll be going in <laughs> early, and it's none of your business why." So she never asked any questions. And in some cases, um, for example, on one occasion, Ridgeway driving to work picked up a young girl, and um, uh, had sex with her, killed her put her in the back of his pickup truck, which had a canopy on top, drove to work, park it, parked it in the work parking lot, went in and worked for four hours, came out at lunchtime, got into his truck, took it to a dead-end road, got in the back of the truck, had sex with the dead body, drove back to work and finished his shift out, got back in his truck at the end of the shift, and on the way home, he... Uh, uh, found a place to put the body, <clears throat> and and drove home. And that night, he kissed his wife hello, and had dinner, and went to bed like any other normal person might do. However, he had just taken the life of a 16-year-old uh, young girl. And he was just that casual about it. I mean, that's sociopath. You know, they're they're unable to empathize. I mean, that's astonishing. You know. You leave work, you go out to lunch, and you you kill a person. Yeah, that's he, unbelievable. He, no remorse. Now, now he was tested, and his IQ was running right around eighty. How did he get away for so long? Yeah, so I mean, he you know he has no remorse. First of all, as you as you mentioned, uh, the life of a person that really meant nothing to to him, and there was an unusual relationship with his mother, as most. Again, I'm not an expert in all serial mur murders, but in most of that I've read about and um, and studied, uh, there is some sort of an unusual relationship with the mother that tends to, um, you know, bend bend certain people toward this kind of behavior. Um, he had no respect for his mother, had no respect for women, and and that's how he he kind of moved forward from from that point. But the way that he uh, avoided detection, you know, was really um, back in those days, you have to remember again that you know the scientific uh, forensic science was really uh, only in its early stages. We still, you know, we used fingerprints, of course, uh, but um, remember m most of the clothing was taken. Mm -hmm. um, nothing left behind at the scenes, really, that could be fingerprinted. Although we did find items that we we consider possibly associated with crime scenes and fingerprinted those, but not always coming up with anything that was discernible, uh, nothing that matched anything in the NCIC database. Um, DNA was not a science uh, until the late 90s. Oh, Lord, uh, it's, so it's we, still not. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> <laughs> so DNA is what helped us solve the case, but uh, we were only looking. So here's how we solved it. Um, in 1982, um, on the riverbank, we had uh, victims who still had uh, were intact, physically um, uh, intact bodies, and we were able to collect some bodily fluids from them. 
uh, which were not of their own but left by behind by the suspect. Those were frozen in a test tube. That was 1982. In 1987, Ridgeway came up as a suspect. We searched his house. We searched his place of work. And we were able to get uh, the judge to allow us to take a body sample, a, a body fluid sample. So we had him chew on a gauze, put it in a test tube, and we froze it. So we have frozen uh, spermatozoa samples from 1982. We have frozen saliva sample from 1987. But if we were to have those examined in that day and age, the only thing that we could get from them would be a blood type. Possibly, mm-hmm. Carol, that wasn't Carol type. That wasn't assured. Yes, so um, we we uh, proceeded forward. We had other items of evidence that that came up uh, that we thought might lead to uh, identifying a suspect. Very microscopic glass beads was one of the things that uh, we spent a lot of time tracking down. They were found at some of the sites and. Um, we discovered that those uh, glass beads, microscopic uh, glass beads, were actually uh, glass beads that were used in painting the white stripes along the roadways and the yellow stripes in the middle of the roadways to make them reflect. And that most people um, in our community, almost all of us, matter of fact, have these glass, microscopic glass beads attached to our socks and the bottoms of our uh, pants and our shoes, so oh, wow. of course they didn't lead anywhere. So we continued to collect, as I said, 10,000 items of evidence. Then in 1998-99, we became aware of the science of DNA. We took those samples. Uh, a detective actually personally transported those to the East Coast. There were only two labs then that did DNA testing. They looked at them and said, your, your samples are so minute and so fragile, uh, we want to wait until the science proceeds forward. Um, We don't want to destroy them. So we continued to freeze them. And in 2001, uh, in March, we submitted those samples. We got a call from the lab saying we we can do it now. We submitted those samples, and on September 10th of 2001, the day before 9-11, Detective Tom Jensen, who is still on the case, back in 2001, and I was the sheriff now by this time, and I had reopened the case when I became sheriff in 1997 and um, <clears throat> started an evidence review team, and we began to kind of relook at things again. And uh, It had been shut down because of budgetary issues, and people felt we weren't going to solve the case. Um, Tom submitted the, the DNA evidence to the lab, on September 10th, Tom came to my uh, office and um, he uh, pulled an envelope out with uh, the DNA uh, graphs on um, two of the victims. They matched, and then he pulled out Ridgeway's uh, gauze DNA analysis, and it matched. And so we uh, then, of course, began to plan how we were going to arrest Ridgeway. We followed him put him under surveillance for a couple of months. He hit on one of our um, undercover um, females who were out yes. on the street. Yeah, our decoy, and uh, we we arrested him because we didn't you know we didn't want to lose him and uh, take the chance that he would actually yeah or lose kill her else again. Yeah, or lose her. So <laughs> um, then and, and then after that, you know, it was it was. Um, a long process of uh, of six months of interrogation um, with his attorneys present, uh, you know, him wanting to save his life, and us wanting to solve as many cases as we get, uh, as we could, in order to uh, give the families the answers that they were all asking. One of the hardest things I've ever done on this case, too, I should mention, is to spend a Friday, Saturday, and a Sunday in a hotel room um, and visit with uh, each one of the family members, well, members from each one of the families that that were on the list, that it it approached near 60, uh, to tell them that we were uh, going to seek 
uh, a deal with Ridgeway uh, to uh, avoid the death penalty. Uh, that was their attorney's requ- his attorney's request. Uh, in return, take us to the sites of uh, additional bodies, and and um, take us to the sites where he dumped bodies. And um, our whole purpose in that was to give answers to as many families as we could as to what happened to their daughters. And um, it was a a long three day wow weekend. Uh, I can only imagine, Congressman. Um... A couple of points uh, for the listeners. I, I can't say this enough. Um, first of all, DNA evidence, it, it is nothing, nothing like you see on television. You know, where they plug in a DNA sample and while Blondie's brushing her hair on CSI, they get a DNA match. It, it could take months. It, it can literally take months to get a DNA match. Um, but let, let's let's move on to your to your last point point there that you just made that's devastating um to make a plea agreement with him it it, uh, let's look at the numbers we've got 48 victims you you pinned a 49th on him but he's admitting to at least 71 was he keeping those do you think in those others in reserve to make a deal like this because you know how they like to stretch that out I'll make a deal with you, and I'll show you where these other bodies are. Well, one thing about about Ridgeway is that he he is he's a pathological liar. So uh, I, I think sometimes, uh, at least we felt as investigators, that he was he was having trouble uh, discerning truth from fiction in his own in his own world that he that he lived mm-hmm. in. But I think we also believe that. There were there were certain things that he was holding back, certain cases that he was not admitting to. Uh, I don't think any of us doubt that that he was keeping secret for whatever reason. We we don't know. It could be that there was some special occurrence during that particular murder that he committed that he wanted to keep to himself. And you know, part sadly, and and uh, I know this is is a tragic thought. Um, that I mean, part of the reason that he can survive in his eight foot by eight foot cell 23 hours a day because he only gets out one hour a day at Walla Walla uh, Penitentiary is that he relives these cases in his mind and especially those that he didn't share with us but again you know we we made a decision uh, to, to do this uh, we felt it was the right thing to do um, the, the King County Prosecutor Norm Mailing uh, at the time, and myself as the sheriff, and meeting with the detectives, there there wasn't, as far as I can remember, one detective that was a naysayer as far as uh, trying to solve as many cases as we could, and not because we wanted to be, you know, to say for our own benefit, and um, to say that you know we solved uh, you know 49 cases or 51 cases, but to, but to give these answers to the family so they could. They could have memorial services for their daughters, and they could uh, they could understand now what actually happened to them. Um, and and uh, again, trying to move on with with their lives, but all the while that that piece of their life, that that important person in their life, that child <laughs> that they had in their home, was ripped out of their ho- house, but also ripped out of their heart and uh, that's a hole that can never be plugged and so we felt like we needed to answer that question for them at least so they could move forward with their lives in in some form or fashion because the choices that we had you know plead guilty to seven we ended up with seven cases four on DNA and three on paint evidence let me explain the paid evidence cases real quickly because mm-hmm. there was a new science associated with investigating uh, paint evidence also that came in, into our um, uh, into interview and that was we had three cases with three pieces of clothing that contained microscopic paint spheres not paint chips but microscopic paint spheres the microscopic paint spheres in one case were attached to a blouse that we found that had been buried for six years and was so decomposed that it would crumble in your fingertips as you picked it up. 
And so microscopic paint spheres were found on these microscopic decomposing fibers that had been buried for six years. This is how thorough we were. Uh, and our scientists at the Washington State Lab did, just did an outstanding, magnificent job uh, in, in, in uh, examining all these samples and coming up with the DNA and the paint samples. The second piece of clothing was a ligature that was tied around Wendy Caulfield's um, throat. She was um, found uh, in July of 1982, and she was in the river for over two weeks. So you have the river washing over this piece of cloth that's still embedded in the cloth with the micro microscopic paint spheres. The third piece of clothing was one found just um, downriver from Cynthia Hines, and I would say it's probably half a mile to a mile downriver. So as Ridgeway left the site after he uh, left Cynthia Hines behind, he drove down the Frager Road and threw that piece of clothing out the river. We didn't know it at the time that it was connected, but we collected it uh, just in case that piece of uh, cloth, that blouse, contained microscopic paint spheres. We had seven cases. Those seven cases we could go to trial on, and he could be found guilty, um, and then go to the penalty phase, and the jury, of course, has two decisions to make. One, put him to death. If they chose mm -hmm. to put him to death, in our state, he would never be put to death. There would just be appeal after appeal after appeal. So now we got your original. <laughs> we know how that feels. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. So you got him, you know, guilty on seven, and we don't have answers. He's not going to talk about the others as long as he's still alive in prison. Um, he could be uh, found guilty, and the jury decide to uh, not put him to death because all it takes is one, as you know, in the penalty phase, one juror to say, "I just can't put anybody to death," and and he doesn't get the death penalty. And then the third option, of course, was that he, would, he could be um, even as bizarre as it might sound to some of, uh, of your listeners. He could be found not guilty. Um, and all you have to do is take a look at the at the uh, O.J. Simpson case, <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, right, and just kind of go, "Oh my gosh!" So um, we decided to make sure that we could get all the information, all the details, as much as we could on every case. And I have to, you know, the team of detectives, again, I, I just want, want to give so much credit to the entire team. My, I happen to be the face of the, uh, of the case. I was the initial detective assigned the first bodies. I was the lead investigator in the case. Uh, and I ended up as the sheriff uh, reopening the case again and then solving it while I was the sheriff. So. I just happen to be the, the name and the face associated with this thing over the 19-year period. But I'll tell you, Tom Jensen was, is a guy that stuck with this case for many, many, many years and has, has managed the information, compared and correlated information over the years. The people that interviewed Ridgeway uh, and all of us who were in those rooms that had the, the TV feeds into the um, interviews, and we would shoot questions into the four detectives, the main detectives that um, that interviewed Ridgeway. We were all a part of that, and I, I can't stress enough the the dedication, compassion, the persistence of each and every person involved in this case. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to make that point, and then and, and also uh, to your listeners the. That there are still little girls out there, and boys, uh, little boys for that matter, today, on the streets. They're runaways. They're living under the freeways. They're being taken advantage of. They're being assaulted. They're being manipulated. Um, we have people who are involved in the human trafficking world still today, and um, these are these are our children. You know, uh, I mean, our children together, and we need to make an effort to find a way to stop human trafficking, to stop our young people from, from being victimized. And then lastly, 
um, remember the families. Um, and, and, I, and sadly, you know, one of the ways for, for, for me, I have the memories of finding the, the, the bodies and collecting the bodies and sifting through the remains, scores and scores and scores of dead bodies of little girls and young women. But if your listeners could even think about, imagine, uh, I even hate to suggest this, but imagine if your daughter was one of the victims in this case, how you would feel uh, and place that feeling on the victims' families because that's how they feel today. The loss is so great they can never overcome it. And and this is our job to try to prevent those these things from happening. Yes, sir. You know, and uh, sir, uh, Congressman, uh, allow me to to thank you, um, as a congressman and as a sheriff. You reopened this case. Uh, I want to thank you for your dedication to bringing closure uh, to this case. And I honestly can't say that I remember another sheriff that sat down for three days in a hotel room and t- spoke specifically individually with victims families uh, thank you for that that was unique and very very appreciated um uh, thank I, you. I i i do know this and i know that we're drawn to a, a, a close uh congressman um two, yeah. two real quick things um i do know that investigators or sheriffs oftentimes in facing the media at the close of a case don't get to say everything that's on their heart and we here at the house of mystery i'd like to give you a minute or two to maybe say those things that were on your heart that you didn't get to say then Uh, would you like to take that opportunity well i I thank you for having me on to, to tell this story and i hope your listeners really got a flavor of how hard this is for the families to move on and what a tragedy it, it is for them to lose their little girls um, and and uh, uh, and also uh, understand that there are young girls and young boys out there today that are in those same positions and tragically some of those lives um, are being taken uh, each and every day uh, and and then lastly, again, just the uh, to think about law enforcement today and the criticism that it's taking. I know these men and women. I've worked with these men and women, not only in my 33-year career in the sheriff's office here in Seattle, but also in my 14 years in Congress. Uh, I've worked with them, and. I would say that for uh, the, the vast majority of men and women in law enforcement, um, they are people who are there because they want to serve. They are willing to put their lives on the line. They are willing to see the ugly side of the world that we live in today to protect those law-abiding citizens from having to see the ugliness that happens uh, day in and day out. Um, I was a part of the team that collected those bodies over the years and went after uh, this killer and tried to collect the evidence uh, because we cared about each and every human being that was connected to this case. It didn't matter to us what the economic uh, stature of the family was, what their racial background was, what their religion was. And in today's world, we are judging people by all of those things. We are all human beings equal in our freedoms given to us by one person, and that's God. And those are, uh, those are rights and freedoms that our founding fathers based our Constitution on. Mm-hmm. That they weren't rights that were granted to us by our government, but they were inalienable rights granted to, to us by our Creator. And each and every one of us should be looking at each other as equal creations in this world and should be treating each other with respect. And especially those men and women who are putting their lives on the line to protect our families. And I thank you for the opportunity to Mm -hmm. to allow me to say those things. Thank you for being on the show. I know that you're 
agents uh, biting at the, the bit here to, to get you off. So uh, we appreciate you being here, and anytime you want to come back and, and talk more, please let us know. Yep, you just you just let us know. We'll be we happy to come back on. Thanks. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank thank you, sir. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.